Uh, actually, this is a little bit of a throwback to work that we had, uh, we've been interested in a long time, but I've been, uh, perhaps for some of the reasons alluded to in John's talk about what happens after college, very interested in the post-college period. So it's kind of helpful for me to reorient uh, and go back to look at some of the things we've been interested in college, and in particular, uh, focusing more on the environment than I've focused on before. And even though the talk is entitled Personality and Contextual Factors, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the environmental contextual factors because I think for those of you who are interested in programming uh, and campus policy, there's a little bit more you could do about it, perhaps. And so it might be helpful uh, to talk about those things uh, in a little bit more depth. I uh, do want to mention, there's, I've had many collaborators over the years and very generous funding from NIAAA, but for the, the work I'm going to be talking about today, I particularly want to acknowledge uh, Phil Wood, a uh, long-term colleague, Asian Park, who's a former graduate student who's a professor at Syracuse now, and Patricia Rutledge, who is a project coordinator who now teaches at Allegheny College. And the main points that I want to focus on today is uh, there's several different, I'm going to focus on two, but different parts of the college environment that uh, is strongly associated with uh, risky or hazardous drinking. Uh, I do want to say that we typically think of environment as distinct from the person. I want to highlight the fact that the two are often confounded, and particularly there's a lot of selection into particular types of environments, and actually some of that is personality-based. Um, and so when we start thinking about personality, we don't want to just think about motives. We don't want to just think about individual differences in alcohol effects. But we also want to think about how people seek out specific niches that are uh, consistent with their personalities. Uh, I'm going to start out here. These are probably data we've already seen in one form or another today. Uh, but if there's one single epidemiologic fact, uh, it's that alcohol use disorders, not just binge drinking, not just heavy drinking, but alcohol use disorders, at least as defined syndromally in the DSM-4, is largely a disorder of emerging adulthood. You could argue strongly, just look, looking at that gradient, that we're talking about a developmental disorder. I mean, it just, it has, uh, and it, actually, we don't have the building up to that, but it builds up very quickly. You see peak hazard rates at age 21 or 20. Uh, I'm sorry, peak hazard rates at 19 with peak prevalences around age 22. And then it drops off very dramatically. The other thing, even though unlike a previous survey uh, of the NLACE uh, that NIAAA sponsored where dependence overall was slightly higher than abuse, uh, uh, abuse is higher overall in uh, NISARC. But if you actually look at this uh, age stratum, you actually see more of those people are diagnosing with dependence. So we're not just talking about, uh, like in the general population, when you see high rates of abuse, it's typically due to the hazardous use item, uh, people driving uh, while intoxicated and that sort of thing. So uh, even though most of what I'm going to be talking about today are heavy drinking indices and not syndromal diagnoses, which I don't have in the, uh, the study I'm going to be talking about today, uh, we're not just talking about binge drinking. We're talking about usually a collection or a syndrome of problems that are highly prevalent in this age group. So uh, as, already, as you've already heard a couple times today, that this transitions are important from a developmental perspective. And this is this major transition from high school to uh, college for those people who go on to college is critical in a number of ways. Uh, and we've heard about it, several of it to, several of today, not you know, being, you know, being responsible for your own medications was an issue that came up. But there's major individual and contextual changes. And, uh, and when we study these prospectively uh, in both national representative studies and in high-risk samples, we see a big increase that occurs. And this is data that you actually sort of just saw from John. Uh, these are monitoring the future data. And it's showing how uh, future college students, while they're in high school, are uh, not drinking as much as their peers who don't go on to college, but at least in terms of their binging type patterns, uh, they actually surpass them, but then by the end of college, they're actually at about the same level. So we do see this big uh, change that's maintained for a period of time and then uh, tends to diminish as people leave that 
uh, context. And if there's anything I've learned studying college student drinking, is there's a lot of strong situational effects. We tend to think of alcohol use disorders as an organismic internal uh, kind of uh, problem, but uh, you see people change settings and you see the rates of these things changing uh, dramatically. Uh, this is also from NISARC. This is uh, analyses that Deborah Dawson uh, published a few years ago. And it's actually something that Mark Goldman, I don't know how many new things I'm going to say today, Mark Goldman was talking about is how residence counts. That in other words, when somebody goes to college, it's not just that they're hanging out with other college students, they're hanging out in certain kind of environments. And what Deborah Dawson did is she looked at it, and if you say this is whether any drinking, any uh, heavy episodic drinking, whether or not they're doing it more than once a month or more than once a week, what some people would call heavy episodic drinking. These are the non-students, either the students. And what you see is we see the highest rates of any, you know, like five or heavy, you know, five, four drinking or uh, heavy episodic drinking in the people who are on campus. And whether or not it's any of it, if it's once a week or more, uh, once a month or more, or once a week or more. And that if you look at the college students who are living with parents, they're actually a very low risk group. And as people move off of campus, it also decreases. And we don't see so many differences over there. So that when we're talking about college, we're not talking about college in some big abstract sense. We're really talking about a certain kind of self-contained uh, environment. And some of the variability across campuses that were alluded today reflects to the extent something is more residential versus non-residential, urban uh, versus non-urban. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to focus on in terms of uh, the th actually the three main vari environmental variables I'm going to talk about, and two are in highly intercorrelated. One is the Greek system, and the other is residence. Uh, and then the other thing I'm going to talk about is class schedule, which is something we've talked about. Both of these are things that I think uh, academic administrators and other people have some uh, potential uh, control over. And here I'm going to, this is Henry Wexler data that's over you know, 15 years old. Old, and this just shows basically a well known Greek effect. Not only that resident Greek members tend to drink the most, and no binge means they're drinkers, but not binge drinkers. Uh, so these are tops of these are total drinkers. Uh, but also, even non resident members of Greek societies uh, tend to drink more than non Greek members. And so we see a gradient there, both for men and for women. And I think it's interesting, if the question is uh, that Mark raised earlier from, I guess it was Susan Pierce, I think you were quoting, of people bring their problems with them. If we actually look at high school bingers when they're in college, uh, those people who go on to Greek, I mean, they're, they've, in these Greek societies uh, who are resident, they're keeping a lot of bingers who are high school bingers. And you see this selection based on prior drinking pattern into the Greek system. Uh, the other thing you see, though, is you look at high school non-bingers, how many of them are binging uh, once they get into uh, college and a uh, function of the Greek system. And you see, actually, that it looks like more, not so much the selection effect I was just referring to, but perhaps more of a socialization effect. And then finally, people who uh, give up binging, that is, they were bingers in high school and now uh, they're no longer, and you see that uh, you don't have that kind of desistance of binging as a function of Greek involvement either. Uh, problem with these data, though, they're retrospective data. These are data he collected uh, while in college asking about high school. But if we want to summarize these, college students on average drink more than their non-college, non-collegiate peers. Uh, on average, they're lighter drinkers before they go off. The college effect doesn't appear to persist much after college. Heavy college drinking is concentrated in on-campus residences and students living off campus, uh, but not with family. Uh, and then we see with the Greek system, there's a lot of selection that's going on. Uh, we see reinforcement of existing drinking patterns. Uh, and uh, we see more socialization or conversion to binge drinking. So I'm going to discuss a study that we finished conducting a couple of years ago called the IMPACT study. Uh, basically, we took every incoming first-time freshman. Uh, we could uh, decide and actually the actual count of number of first-time freshmen depends upon how many credit hours they had. We would argue, uh, you know, uh, maddeningly amount. 
to figure out how to decide because so many students have college credits when they're coming in or had a little bit or the summer before. But basically we were able to get out of 44, out of 4,200 people, uh, close to 90% of them. Uh, we had eight waves of follow-up at each semester. And uh, depending upon, yeah, and so it, and it varied the number of follow-up occasions that we had at each wave. We tried to collect data on everyone, regardless of whether or not they had participated at the preceding wave, unless they told us never to darken their door again, in which case we didn't. Uh, in one of the, what we call our baseline papers, we wanted to look at how much the people in our sample were actually changing between summer welcome and say, uh, it was actually similar to another study we heard about today, about 10, 11 weeks into the semester. Uh, so we wanted to characterize pre-college variables that predicted this increase and uh, just to characterize the amount of increases we were seeing, we asked about how often you get high or drunk, how often did you get drunk, we asked about five plus drinking, and you could see the frequencies here, and across the board we saw, as you would expect, increases both for men and women across these alternative measures of heavy drinking. Uh, I want to, this is a very busy slide, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things here. One is if we look at just predicting first semester drinking from pre-college drinking, we, collect, we have 46% of the variance. We throw a lot of other variables in, and after we throw all of these things in, we get it up to 54%. You know, so for one, Pete, there is this tremendous continuation of drinking pattern that we're seeing as we go on, but if we do want to highlight uh, uh, a few of the important findings, I would say, is one is pro college pre-drinking norms, and then the other is this pre-college, what we call college party motivation, people who say they want to go on to college in order to have a good time and to party. Those are probably the only two variables we're getting much unique prediction out of uh, when we think about this uh, uh, transition. So to just summarize again, we're seeing this uh, heavy drinking increase. Uh, I didn't put these uh, interaction analyses in, but I will tell you much of the increase came from the lighter drinkers becoming heavier as opposed to very heavy drinkers becoming much heavier. Uh, we found uh, it, the heavy drinking uh, was a strong predictor, as I had mentioned earlier and from these other studies and college party motivation, cigarette use, and religiosity were all important predictors of that change uh, uniquely above it. So the next piece I want to go on to is to actually dig down a little bit uh, beyond where most studies do when they look at the Greek effect, and that is to actually look at uh, what we call here microenvironments of residence hall and specific Greek houses. So we wanted to investigate self-selection again. We know that people self-select into the Greek system. Uh, but we also wanted to know beyond that, are they selecting into specific Greek houses uh, on the basis of drinking? And then, even though we didn't expect to see much, what about residence halls? Residence halls are semi-random, but they're not totally random. You could have preferences for roommates. And a lot of universities now are organized around things like freshman interest groups. They could be called different things. So their selections that are occurring, uh, even though it might not be as obvious. Uh, and so, again, the typical study compares selection at the fraternity versus residence hall, say. Uh, there's some complexities of our study that I'm going to uh, mention in a minute, including the difference between men and women and when they could affiliate. Uh, but we were interested not just in this difference, but whether or not we could find differences here in terms of the specific residence unit, in terms of both what pre-existing drinking patterns may have existed and how much there may have been different socialization rates and how they affected folks. So this just uh, as a function of these different groups, and I'm just going to describe the complexity here. Uh, you could have men live in the residence hall, and if they were Greek, they lived in the Greek houses. There were some people that were in between and we threw them out and made things complex. For the women in their first year, they were not allowed to live in the houses. They had to live in the residence halls, even though they could pledge and become a part. So those complicate a little bit the analyses that I'm going to show. But I do want to highlight one thing here that we see is in terms of whether or not uh, people are going to select into living type, and that is fraternities or non-fraternities, uh, for the men, 
we see pre-college drinking, heavy drinking, defined either as 5 plus drinking or 12 plus drinking as being predictive. Uh, for who's going to be a, uh, a sorority uh, member, we see at least for the 5 plus drinking selection as well. So these people who are heavier drinkers are selecting into the Greek system. Now, I want to highlight a couple of things. Again, it's a busy slide, so I'm going to focus your attention where I want you to actually look at. We're seeing here for, this is for the men. Uh, so men go into either residence halls or fraternity houses. These are random effects. That is, we're looking at the effects above and beyond whether or not they're Greek or non-Greek. That is, those residual variants associated at the unit of housing level. Okay. And what we see here is that we have selection of, uh, based on five plus drinking uh, for the men uh, into residence halls, which actually surprised us. We didn't think we would necessarily see any there. And then, not surprisingly, we see uh, for both five plus drinking and 12 plus drinking that there were specific houses. In other words, some houses polled for heavier drinkers than others and we could resolve it both at the level of you know, heavy drinking and then very, very heavy drinking. Uh, for the women, uh, we see, again, the overall selection uh, effect based on five or more drinks. And we also see uh, a little bit of uh, residual variation due to the residence hall. So again, that's probably due to the fact that there's some other kind of matching going on that's putting heavier drinkers and lighter drinkers together into the same environments. Uh, now, if we look at the socialization effect, here we're controlling for pre-drinking, which we know is a very big effect. And what we see is just big main effects, largely, for the, for the men. That is, if you're in a fraternity, you get a bigger effect increase. But we don't see a lot of, at the five plus drinking, but for the really excessive drinking, excuse me, for the really excessive drinking, the 12 plus, here we see actually this is really distinguishing a number of the fraternities, the ones that are promoting the really high excessive drinking. Uh, for the women, uh, we basically just see these main effects of socialization on uh, both 5 plus and 12 plus drinking, uh, but we don't see those same kind of random effects that we see. So it's more like if you're in a sorority, it means the same thing if you're in sorority A or alpha versus beta. Uh, so uh, it's clear incoming students are seeking out environments that facilitate the continuation or the escalation of their drinking patterns. Uh, don't want to go into too much detail on the motives for college attendance, but uh, if we had gone deeper into those tables, you would see that that mediates part of those effects. Uh, and then living in certain fraternity houses associated with greater socialization and extremely risky drinking uh, than other ones. Want to just highlight something, and actually I think this is a very similar to, or at least uh, similar to a paper that Sean published a number of years ago, I believe, looking at change. Didn't you have a paper on change in uh, Greek affiliation over time? Because one of the things that's very helpful is often is to sort of use people as their own controls. That is, to study what happens uh, if we think there's this big structural effect. What if we look at people who start out Greek and end up not Greek? And we look at people who start out not Greek and end up Greek, even though most people are either consistently non-Greek or consistently Greek. And so we do a longitudinal latent class analysis, and we're able to come up with these four groups of people, and then basically show that uh, we tend to get tracking of people's drinking or level of heavy drinking, as well as alcohol-related consequences. It's not perfect, but it does suggest that as people are moving from one environment into the other, it's not this fixed characteristic that was based on this strong selection effect that we had seen earlier. Uh, and if we look at potential mediators, we see that we are going along with this, and we actually stop it after the junior year, because when everybody's 21, the alcohol availability issue becomes uh, much less. And one of the things we do find is we have potential mediators like availability and pure drinking norms uh, tracking these. 
So uh, just to summarize here, changes in Greek status are associated with changes in alcohol-related environmental variables, such as peer norms and alcohol availability, as well as changes in alcohol use behaviors. Uh, and I didn't go through this here, but we could also show a number of ways Greeks are different at baseline, but even controlling for the way they're different at baseline, we're able to show as environment changes, these other things change as well. So uh, I'm going to take a, basically two minutes to go over this, since I have five minutes total, and then three minutes on the last uh, bit I want to cover. So one of the things that's been out there, and in fact was in that college report that Mark alluded to earlier, was this notion of Friday class schedule could affect Thursdays, even though there was virtually no data in the literature. It was just kind of common lore. And so we went out to see to what extent that could be. And if we look at uh, men, first of all, we demonstrate this Thursday, thirsty Thursday. Uh, this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight here refers to semester in college, or at least the first four semesters, actually, first eight semesters of college. Not everybody graduates who even stays continually enrolled uh, within four years. And what you see is the weekend starts early, and it starts early both for men and for women. And so we wanted to see, okay, could we dig down, drill down a little bit further in this? And then we looked at the time. This is the earliest Friday class you have and the, uh, the number of drinks you have on Thursday night. And what you see is a pretty strong gradient up to about here. And you see it both for men and women. And uh, I believe this is still the strongest demonstration of this phenomenon, which I think has tremendous policy implications. Uh, the other piece uh, here is, well, let me, did I just, what did I just show? Okay, we have it by sex here. And then the other piece I wanted to say is this looks like it's heavily moderated by level of Greek involvement, too. Uh, so here we have another. So there's, there's this effect of day of the week, uh, but there's also the effect of Greek involvement. And I just realized something I had here, too. One of the other things, too, is I just want to mention uh, is that we also restrict these analyses to people who had variants on that over the four years of college to make it more of what's called a cost, case crossover design in epidemiology to make sure we weren't picking up too much selection in those kinds of analyses and were able to replicate those effects. So I'm going to very quickly go through. We know personality is important from a variety of different uh, kinds of studies, uh, the two biggies being disinhibition and neuroticism. Uh, there are data suggesting an important reason is motivations for use, and we've already heard a bit about motivations today. This is a slide from my colleague Lynn Cooper, who suggests that drinking to enhance is related to positive emotionality and uh, social emotional enhancement expectancies. Actually, we're seeing this, the, just the top number there. And then uh, negative emotions with drinking to cope. Actually, there's a much, this is the first study in here. It's a very robust finding, much stronger findings, internationally replicated on numerous occasions. Uh, we have data to show how it works prospectively and uh, in change. It might even be related to maturing out of drinking problems as personality and motives change. Uh, another one is that I've been interested in since my graduate school days is different personalities react to alcohol differently and have differential reinforcement value. And we have Duke Scholar, wasn't William McDougall at Duke? That's what I thought. William McDougall was probably the most famous English-speaking psychologist uh, in the first part of uh, the 20th century. He was the William James Professor of Psychology at Harvard. And in a 1920 paper, he talked about how the extrovert became more radically disinhibited than the introvert in Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology. And so, you know, so here is you know, you know, 80 years after McDougall saying, here's McDougall said this first. And many people have since followed. Uh, but the piece, this last piece I'm going to talk about is environmental selection. Uh, and the basic notion is individuals select into different environments in part because of personality traits. Some of these environments impose risk for alcohol problems. Uh, and the last two points, or subpoints, I think are unique and important. Some selection may be related to drinking aspects of the environment. Some may be incidental but still put somebody at high risk. So that's what these last couple slides I'm going to show you, that, that there may be different forms of personality environment covariation associated with risk for alcohol problems. 
And this is uh, just a simple a slope intercept model where we're modeling drinking during the first semester of college and then change over the next three years. Uh, here is the basic model. We have pre-college heavy drinking looking at Greek status. So this is our environmental variable we're looking at here. And we see both a strong selection effect here with these uh, coefficients. And then we see uh, a socialization effect to drinking during the first semester. And then also on the slope. So we see Greek, people are selecting into the Greek system. Uh, there's a socialization effect that's immediate, and there's also a continuing one. Plus, if we look at this pre-college heavy drinking, we do see that there's also that strong prediction. Uh, what we do is then we add personality traits from the, uh, and say, how does that reflect both pre-college heavy drinking and affiliation with the Greek environment? The thing I want to highlight here is that if you look at there's virtually no association between pre-college drinking and extroversion. Uh, but uh, there is between with Greek affiliation, uh, it's 0.39 and 0.42, so it's pretty hefty. And it puts somebody into the pre-college heavy drinking. Actually, the novelty seeking, after we control for the heavier drinking later, we don't really see the same kind of prediction we would expect to see it to the Greek system after we control for the pre-college heavy drinking. There's a kind of suppression going on there. So people are selecting into the Greek system on personality. One is the partying, and the other is perhaps so, the, the social uh, aspects of living in uh, a, a Greek house, the service orientation that are associated with Greek houses. But once they're there, they're they're, they've put themselves at risk. And so I think when we're thinking about how does personality relate to environmental selection, we could think of them as being and really in two ways. One related to the, the drinking itself. The other is being in a house where a lot of drinking goes on, but they want to be in that house for other reasons. But then they put themselves in their high exposure. So for personality selection, individuals select into this, both for traits related to alcohol seeking and traits that are incidental to drinking, but it still puts them at high risk. And so I think understanding personality-based environment selection requires understanding the fit between the trait and the needs the environment will satisfy. And there, I think there's a lot of prevention implications for that. Uh, and I think uh, just uh, some closing comments, since I'm out of time, is that right? And Okay. Uh, I think what I do want to say with the, there are uh, personality-based interventions that have been developed and are still being developed to try and satisfy some of these. Uh, but also, uh, we've had, a, since our study was published on class schedule, and I've not seen the outcomes, a number of universities have tried to reinstate, like reclaim Fridays and put them back. And it, uh, to the extent we have good evaluations of those, we'll see whether or not there's actually a causative effect uh, or not there. The other piece is when we're thinking about